Welcome back to the channel. Today, we are going to take five of your questions and get them answered. So we're gonna be covering topics like color management, we're gonna have a little bit of a gear discussion, creative LUTs, and even more. So I I'm looking forward to this. By the way, if this is your first video here, uh, my name's Barrett Kaufman, I'm a film colorist, and the whole reason why this channel exists is to help artists like you level up their ability to tell beautiful stories through film. So if that sounds like something you wanna be part of, make sure to hit the subscribe button and notification bell, and you will get all these videos in the future. All right, let's jump in with this first question. So uh, Ban Bonds asked, this was on the uh, the Bleach Bypass video that I did, could you possibly create a tutorial on how to properly make a creative LUT? Okay, so uh, creative LUTs are a really long conversation that we could spend like hours discussing. So uh, I'm going to do my best to keep this brief today. Rather than try to teach you everything in a short, you know, short little bit here, I want to give you some principles to work off of that hopefully you can experiment around with. And the first principle that I want to like emphasize when it comes to building creative LUTs is they need to be scene respecting. And so just as an example here, I have this uh, shot, this is a shot on a black magic camera and I already have color management in place. And so when you're building a LUT, one of the things you want is you want it to respect the scene space. So this is, I'm currently working in DaVinci Wide Gamut. If I enable and disable this LUT, you'll notice that this is not changing the scene space. So we're not going from DaVinci Wide Gamut to Rec. 709. It's expecting, you know, uh, DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate in, and it's returning the same thing out on the other side. Whenever you're building any sort of creative LUT, this is an essential component because you don't want to bake in any technical transformation. The second principle that's really important when it comes to building creative LUTs is you want it to respect the exposure of the scene. So just to jump back to this LUT example, you'll notice that as I enable and disable it, it's not brightening or darkening anything. I have found so many LUTs out there that have some sort of like exposure shift built into them. Maybe there's some sort of, you know, gamma adjustment or maybe something like offset where let's say that these two were baked into the same LUT, where it's like we're darkening the scene rather than respecting the current exposure. And this is especially important for artists who don't shoot and grade their footage. If you are, if a cinematographer shot it and they're passing it off to you as the colorist, that cinematographer, a huge portion of their job is exposing the scene correctly. So you want to honor that exposure throughout the process. So whenever you're using a creative LUT, don't artificially raise or lower the exposure unless the cinematographer explicitly asks you to do it for the whole piece. The third guiding principle here is neutrals should remain neutral unless you explicitly decide to change that. This also applies to the middle grade conversation of when we're developing our split toning. More often than not, we wanna keep our split tone where it splits right at middle gray unless you're intentionally trying to do something else. You don't want to accidentally mess around with that. This is one of those rules that you can break, but you shouldn't unless you are explicitly doing so. The fourth principle that I'll just send your way is whenever you're building a creative LUT, it needs to work globally on all the footage it is intended to be applied to. What I mean by that is if you're developing a creative LUT for just one project, well, that LUT only needs to work on that one project. But if you're developing that LUT to then be used on many projects in the future, you have a different level of testing that you need to do. You need to be testing on a wider variety of footage. The next question comes from Aaron Davies. And uh, he mentions, I have seen a lot of colorists use CSTs in the node view to control when the transformation into the output color space happens. But DaVinci seems to encourage the use of color management to convert to the output color space before the node tree. Do you use CSTs in the nodes out of habit or is there some tangible benefit to this? Okay, yeah. so this is an interesting question. It's basically the, 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 the debate of, do you use project level color management or you, do you use node-based color management? So there's kind of a simple and a more complex answer to this question. The simple answer is, if you like the results you're getting, go with whatever works best. Here's the slightly more complex answer, and there is some personal preference built into this. I feel like it's easier for me to diagnose color management issues when they are in nodes. I feel like I have a little more control over the process. And if you use project-based color management, you actually lose some control of what you can do on the output display transform. So let me just give you a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about. If we were just to use um, standard resolve color management, I know it looks like a lot's going on here, but all this is is a, a layer mixer node. So um, this is all that's happening. This is a standard color space transformation from DaVinci Wide Gamut to Rec. 709, right? A very basic process. And you could get very similar results if you were to use project-based color management. 
But here's the thing you're missing if you only use project level color management. Sometimes these output transforms are referred to as DRTs or display rendering transforms. Uh, you know, simply put, they're trying to take you from a scene space to a display space. Well, DaVinci Resolve's solution to get from scene to display isn't the only option out there. So to just show you a difference, uh, let me show you this. So what you're seeing here on the screen is using, uh, we're going from DaVinci Wide Gamut to Rec. 709, but with OpenDRT. So OpenDRT is built by Jed Smith, and he is a really smart color scientist who has worked on developing an alternative method from getting to scene to display space. And what you'll notice is there's a lot of different controls in here, more controls than what Resolve naturally gives us in the output display transform. Now, as I compare these two, so let me uh, kind of revert back to Resolve CST, you might say that you really like Resolve Solution better than OpenDRT, and that's fine, but that might not be true for every project. What we're doing is we're opening kind of our boundaries to look at what are different ways of transforming from scene to display. So let me show you one other example here. Uh, what you're seeing here is this is one of the candidate transforms for ACES 2.0. So uh, let me just do a little comparison here. So this is Resolve Color Management, and this is maybe what ACES 2.0 would look like. It's, it's not guaranteed, it's one of the candidate transforms, but ACES has a slightly different way of solving the scene to display problem. Now, once again, if you like the way Resolve solves things, totally fine, and you can use project level color management. But if you're using project level color management, you don't have the option to try these other DRT options. Also, some creative LUTs are built assuming certain DRTs in place. Now, in general, most creative LUTs for Resolve will assume Resolve color management, but you can sometimes get slightly different results with those creative LUTs if you have a different DRT on the end. I realize this might be getting fairly technical pretty fast, but what I'm trying to show you is using node-based color management could provide more options in the future should you choose to creatively look at those paths. The final thought I'll throw out there is I have seen some places offer what they call finishing LUTs, and so those are LUTs that are meant to be applied to Rec. 709 footage. Now, I think that's a terrible idea, but some people do use those finishing LUTs, and if you do, you would need to be able to apply that after the display transformation. And if you're using Resolve Color Management, you can't do anything after that display transformation. So you would need to use node-based color management in order to use those finishing LUTs. In case you wanna play with the Jed Smith OpenDRT, I'll put a link to that on my resource page. So uh, check that out in the description. The next question comes from uh, Mustafa Kamal, and uh, you were asking, what is the pen mouse thing? Is that an iPad? Oh, I love this question. So this is one of my favorite little accessories for doing color grading. So this is the uh, the, the Wacom Intuos Pro, and basically it's, it's kind of like a touchpad, but you can also use a stylus and it's meant to be a mouse replacement. Uh, kind of the concept is using a mouse is not very ergonomic for your hand and it's easy to get, you know, carpal tunnel. And so holding a pen is a slightly more ergonomic way of doing things. Also, uh, whenever you use a, a Wacom tablet like this, or I imagine there's many other brands out there, whenever you move your mouse, you're moving in an absolute way. And so what I mean by that is if I move this mouse to the top corner of the screen, if I move this to the, the top right corner, my mouse instantly moves there. However, with a mouse, if you have a large screen, you might have to move the mouse, reset and reset to keep the mouse going in one direction. So I actually find that it's a really quick way of moving around. The first time I heard about this was from uh, Adam Epstein, who is one of the Saturday Night Live editors. And when I checked it out, uh, it was a little more expensive than I was expecting, at least compared to like computer mice. But I just decided to sign up for it and to go for it and uh, I've fallen in love with it. I have had it for, at this point, probably nine years. Uh, I've had to replace the stylus once, but uh, it's, it's been awesome. I'll put a link to it on my resource page in case you wanna check it out further. The next question comes from Sander, and this was on the, uh, the how to use the RGB mixer video. Uh, Sander was asking, I was wondering if a creative LUT such as film emulation would more or less do the same, pushing certain cues and saturation levels to a more cohesive look. Or would there be cases where you would use the RGB mixer method in conjunction with a creative LUT? Absolutely, I would say mix and match, you know, to whatever, whatever your heart's desire is to make the look you want. You can absolutely mix and match the two. Just as an example here, uh, I have a creative LUT uh, that I already have built for this scene, but there's nothing wrong if you wanna pull out the, uh, the good old RGB mixer and let me pull out the uh, vector scope here. And let's say uh, oftentimes in more filmic looks, we wanna take the yellows and bend them a little towards red. So let's do something like that. Like let's take the, uh, the red output here, well, the, the green information in the red output and bump that up ever so slightly. We'll give a little more there. We'll take a, a little less out of the blue. And just with that little tiny adjustment, you'll notice that we're rotating the yellows a little more towards red. You can kind of see that in the sticky notes. Here's the before. Here's the after. They're getting a little more orangey there. Uh, that's also saturating the image slightly, so, you know, 
if I was doing this on my own project, there is a chance that I would ever so slightly desaturate things, very small. But we're ever so slightly warming up some of the yellows in the image. Something to keep in mind is LUTs are just modifications of input values, so there's nothing inherently magical about film emulation LUTs compared to other LUTs. All it is is a color goes in, and it spits a color out the other side. That's all it's doing. So um, there's no reason why you can't use an RGB mixer in conjunction with a creative LUT. Now, if the creative LUT was built poorly, yeah, that might break the image. But if you have a well-designed creative LUT, you probably are going to be fine. And to push this point a little further, one of the things that I encourage all colorists to do is even when you're using a creative LUT, if you didn't build that creative LUT, ask yourself, is there anything you could do to make this a little bit better? And then go make it happen. I think that's one of the ways we can start developing our tastes, even if we're using other people's pre-built work, to ask, what could we do to make this a little bit better? And in this process, you're making it your own as well. All right, last question of the video. Rogue Marble said, uh, great video. You've mentioned changing the grade over the course of a scene. Is this process done manually slash numerically using some sort of keyframing or, you know, uh, another method there? Okay, so this is in reference to uh, if you saw my video on how to grade a feature film, it was a case study on a feature that I graded. And in that breakdown, I talked about there was a scene in the film that started more desaturated, but then over the course of the scene, as characters learned information, uh, ever so slightly got more saturated. It was almost like the sun kind of came out behind the clouds a little bit. So there's a couple ways you could approach this. Uh, the two that come to mind first though are, you have to decide what's your delivery. Are you exporting the final delivery for your project? Because if you are, you can really easily put an adjustment layer over that scene and just do a keyframe on that adjustment layer from lower saturation to higher saturation. The problem was I couldn't use that method on the feature film because I was delivering a color round trip back to a finishing editor. And when you're delivering a round trip, that adjustment layer doesn't necessarily get baked into the clips beneath it. So what I did is I used that adjustment layer to give, uh, to give me a reference point for how saturated each of those clips should be. But then I turned the adjustment layer off and then manually tweaked each clip saturation so that over time, with each clip, it was uh, slowly getting more and more. And then within those clips, if I had one really long shot, I did put saturation keyframes in there to, to slightly progress it over the time. Well, there are the five questions for this video. If you found it helpful, make sure to hit the like button and let me know your thoughts down in the comments. All right, I'll see you in the next one.